Say this on him. Now, Paul, early in this letter, he told the Colossian church that he thanked God for them every time that he prayed for them. He said that back in verse 2 of Colossians 1. And now in our passage, he circles back to that reference to his prayers in order to give them more detail into how he prayed for them, how he prayed for them on an ongoing basis. Now, I'm not sure that the Colossians at that point in history were really capable of appreciating the significance of the Apostle Paul praying for them. I think that if they knew what we now know about Paul, if they knew then what we now know about Paul, they would have been somewhat awestruck by the fact that this apostle, this, this great apostle, was praying for them in such specific ways. Now, I know it isn't the same as a cloth prayed over by Rod Parsley or Kenneth Copeland at a special 2015 blood moon service, which can be yours for free if you email a certain person. But still, having the Apostle Paul praying for you regularly, it's got to be a close second to that, doesn't it? But the truth is that we have a much better prayer warrior, one who ever lives above for me to intercede. Jesus regularly prayed for his disciples during his earthly ministry, and even now he always lives to make intercession for us, as Hebrews 7.25 puts it. But Paul's prayer life and the content of his prayers even though they're, they're secondary to, they're subordinate to the fact that Jesus Christ prays for you and me right now, they can serve as a pattern for us in our own prayer life. In his devotional on this passage, David Pallison wrote this, As you pray for others, pray intelligent prayers that braid together the real God and the real person in the real life situation. If you are alert to both the Redeemer and the real needs of the needy, you won't ever pray rote prayers. Now, what does that imply? Pallison goes on in this devotional to, to, to further elucidate what he means. That means you need to know the people for whom you pray. It means you need to know their struggles. You need to know some intimate details about them so that you can pray intelligently for them, not praying like the babblers do, the pagans do simply trying to wear down their gods in order to win them over and get what they want. No, your prayers need to be intelligent and intelligible prayers to the Lord on behalf of those for whom you pray. Now, Paul had never even met the Colossian Christians, and yet he prayed in wonderfully specific ways for them. And one of the ways that he prayed for them was that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, we live in an age, in the age of information. But with all of the information of the world at our fingertips, wisdom, understanding, true knowledge, these seem to have gone totally extinct. They're no longer regarded as important. What's important to us is what we can get on our phones, the news feed that comes across. That's what's important. That's what dictates to us how we live our lives. Well, Paul is saying there's a different way and there's a better way. And it's through the wisdom of Christ. So as we work our way through the sermon, I would ask you to, uh, to, to consider this thought. God gives wisdom to his people in order for us to be built up into his spiritual temple. Let me say that again. God gives wisdom to his people in order for us to be built up into his spiritual temple. Well, the first part of the sermon I've titled Knowledge, Wisdom, and Understanding. The second, A Worthy Manner. And the third, Out of Darkness. Again, Knowledge, Wisdom, and Understanding. That's the first point of the sermon. The second, A Worthy Manner. The third, Out of Darkness. So let's look at the first point uh, this morning. Knowledge, Wisdom, and Understanding. So Paul tells them again in verse 9 about his regular prayers for them, for the Colossian church. And as already mentioned, this time he specifically talks about how he was praying for them, what the content of his prayers were. His petition to the Lord is that the Colossians would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom, wisdom and understanding. Okay, so in that proposition statement... What I said to you was that God is giving us wisdom in order for us to be built into his temple. How in the world did I get that from this passage? Well, our friend G.K. Beale, 
uh, helps us out here. And this is what he says about this phrase, filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. In this phrase, Beale discerned an allusion to several Old Testament passages having to do with the construction of the tabernacle and later the temple. And so, for instance, in Exodus 31.3, the Lord says about Bezalel, and I have filled him with the spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. In Exodus 35, verses 31 to 32, it uses a very similar, almost the identical phrase there. During Solomon's reign, when, when construction on the temple was about to begin, Solomon summoned Hiram from Tyre, and we read this about him in 1 Kings 7, 14. He was the son of a widow of the, of the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in bronze, and he, that is Hiram, was full of wisdom and understanding and skill for making any work in bronze. He came to King Solomon and did all this work. Now, Beale contends that this is a deliberate allusion to these verses on Paul's part, because these are the only places where, one, the spirit, and two, filling, and three, uh, they, are, they are directly linked to wisdom and understanding and knowledge. Now, the passage from Isaiah 11, which is at the top of this morning's order of worship, it's another place where these words are put together. There's a different word used there for the word filling, and it's not explicitly about the temple, at least uh, those first few verses that we, that we read. But we have to understand that Paul was a master of the Bible, which we refer to as the Old Testament. That was his Bible. He was well-versed in all of it. He would have had vast portions of Scripture memorized. But setting aside Paul for a moment, the Holy Spirit, the primary author of the Old Testament and Paul's letters, he knew it all perfectly, as well as his original authorial intent. And so this is a deliberate, I think, and I think Beale would say the same, it's a deliberate, deliberate allusion that Paul is making back to these passages in the Old Testament, which serves the purpose of broadening the context for how we understand this passage. And when we have a broader, under, uh, uh, broader context, it affects the meaning and the interpretation of what Paul is writing. So what, what is Paul saying by making these indirect but, uh, but, but certainly uh, 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 deliberate references to Exodus and 1 Kings and Isaiah 11? Well, Exodus 31 and Exodus 35, they're about the construction of the tabernacle. 1 Kings is about the construction of the temple. Isaiah 11 is speaking of the one who will come from the stump of Jesse, which is an indirect reference to the lineage, lineage of King David. And so someone who descends from David, who is king himself, will be endowed by the Holy Spirit with wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of Yahweh. That's what the passage in Isaiah 11 is saying. And all of this culminates in Isaiah 11 verse 9 when the Lord speaks of my holy mountain, which is a reference to Zion, more specifically to the temple. Indirectly then... Paul is telling the Colossians that he is praying that they will be endowed with the same gifts that the tabernacle and the temple builders of old had been given by the Holy Spirit, but also, and above all else, with the same gifts that the Messiah himself had. He's praying for the Colossians that they will have these gifts in order that they can be built into this temple, one building together, unified. One of Paul's favorite metaphors for the church, that is for the people of God here on earth, is that we are God's temple. And you find this in places such as 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Now, Paul is not speaking of individual believers here. All of the yous, the four yous in that passage are all in the plural. He's speaking to the church, the Corinthians as the church. And he's saying, y'all are the temple. And if someone tries to tear you down, the Lord is going to destroy them. He speaks similarly in Ephesians 2, 19 and 22. We already read this passage, but he says in those specific verses that they are no longer strangers and aliens. They are members of the household of God. And this household is being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus being the cornerstone of that foundation. This foundation having been laid, the Ephesian Christians are being formed into the upper part of the structure. What's being built upon the foundation, what's sometimes in architectural terms known as the superstructure of the building. 
And being joined together, Paul says, they will grow into a holy temple in the Lord, being built into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. As Peter puts it in 1 Peter, we are living stones that God is using to build his temple. Now, some of you live in smart homes to, uh, powered by varying degrees of artificial intelligence but, intelligence. but what Paul is speaking of here is about God's home powered by divine intelligence. He is building it. He's building it through us. He's giving us wisdom. We are willing participants in the construction of ourselves into God's temple. And the way that this smart temple displays our divine knowledge, wisdom, and understanding is through our worthy manner of walking. And that brings us to the next section, the second part of the sermon, a worthy manner. Paul is praying that the Colossians would have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, so, as he says in verse 10, as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Now, the popularized depiction of a wise man is some sort of guru, right? Somebody who who lives on the top of a mountain and and people go to the Himalayas and they try to find him and they they have some deep burning question. They go to this guru who's off in isolation. He's got all the wisdom that he can possibly have. That's that's the popularized depiction of, of the wise man. But Paul is saying that the wise man will be known not by his remote location, Not by his ascetic lifestyle, but by his behavior. By the way that he conducts himself in this life. That he conducts himself among others in this life. Not in isolation from other people. So true wisdom, true understanding, true knowledge will result in walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. And this comes only from the Lord himself. Which is why Paul so regularly prays asking God to give wisdom to the Colossians. Paul writes later in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, he says this, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is in Christ, in whom are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul is saying here that Jesus is the source of all wisdom, all knowledge, all understanding. But elsewhere in Colossians, Paul will describe Scripture as that source. Chapter 3, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So which is it? Is, Is it the word itself or is it Christ that is the source of all wisdom? Well, Paul's not contradicting himself in these two passages. Jesus Christ is the word, and the word of God referring to Scripture and at the point in time which Paul wrote in the Old Testament scripture, is all about Jesus Christ. So Paul can tell the the Colossians, sing these psalms, sing them to one another, teach each other about Jesus Christ from these psalms. And he could do so because he understands that not only the psalms, but all of the Old Testament scriptures are about Jesus. They're about him. And so by letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, you will be able to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And so Jesus Christ and the word which is all about him, these are the source of all wisdom, but they are also the content of wisdom. And so if you would be wise, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. In verses 10 to 12, Paul lays out what Beal calls the uh, uh, fourfold manner by which believers walk worthily to please the Lord. We walk worthily pleasing the Lord by bearing fruit, by increasing in the knowledge of God, by being strengthened, and by giving thanks. These are four participial phrases that you find there. So let's look at the first Uh, one of these, bearing fruit. Paul says in verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. And we spoke a few weeks back about the fruit of love. And we understood then that 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 true faith in Jesus Christ will result in a love for all of the saints, as Paul put it in verse 4. If you are a Christian, 
then you will bear fruit. You are bearing fruit right now. That is the unfailing work of the Holy Spirit in you. And one of those fruits is love for all of the saints. The Apostle John in 1 John 4, 20 to 21 says this, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever, whoever loves God must also love his brother. But Paul expands on this. His prayer for the Colossians is that by growing in knowledge, wisdom, understanding, they will bear, bear fruit in every good work. Boiling it down, every good work is loving and serving God and loving and serving our neighbors. The second uh, way, the manner in which we walk in a, in a manner worthy of the Lord is increasing in the knowledge of God. So Paul prays that the Colossians would bear fruit. He also prays that they would increase in the knowledge of God. Now, once again, there's an allusion to Genesis 1.28, in which God commands man to be fruitful and multiply or increase. There, of course, the Lord is telling Adam how he was to take dominion and subdue the earth. But as la last week, as we saw, we, we now take dominion in spiritual ways by increasing in our knowledge of God and increasing the knowledge of God throughout the world. The knowledge of God comes to us through the word of the truth, the gospel. As Paul puts it in verse 5, the gospel increases our knowledge of God and the gospel brings unbelievers into a knowing relationship with God. The third manner in which believers walk worthily of the Lord is being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. The Christian is strengthened by God's power. If you by faith are in Christ, you are being given the power of God, having already been raised to life by that power. God's power is at work in you. Paul says in, in chapter 1, verse 29, that he toils and struggles in his proclamation of the gospel by God's energy. God powerfully works within Paul. The power of God that energizes Paul, he prays for the Colossians, that they will have it. And he wants them to have it so that they will endure hardship, that they will, so that they'll endure, endure the toil and the struggle that's set before them, and that they'll do it with patience and joy. Weakness, not strength, weakness results in giving up and giving in. There's very little joy in a weak person who is overcome by something that is stronger than they are. Power, given by God, results in joy, even in the face of hardship. And finally, Paul wants the Colossian Christians to give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. As we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, we are giving thanks to the Father. If you are not a thankful person, pray that you will become a thankful person. Pray that you'll be content. Pray that you'll have gratitude. There are many reasons why you ought to be thankful to God. But perhaps the chief reason is that he has qualified you, as Paul says, to receive the inheritance laid up in heaven for all the saints. You haven't qualified yourself. Indeed, you cannot qualify yourself, but God has. The Father has qualified you. You have become an heir by faith in Jesus Christ, and you have received the spirit, spirit of adoption. When all else is tanking in your life, consider this and ask God to help you be thankful despite your circumstances. Despite your losses, and no doubt, many people are suffering losses right now. If you've got retirement accounts, you're suffering losses. And you look at those things and you see how things are going down, down, down. That's not where your hope is. That's not what your hope is in. Your hope is in the Lord who has laid up for you an inheritance that cannot be taken from you. And that brings us to the third and the final point of the sermon this morning, out of darkness. Having a share in the inheritance of the saints in light means that we have been delivered from the domain of darkness and we have been transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son, as Paul puts it in verse 13. We have been called out of darkness. We are no longer in death's domain. We're no longer under its dominion. Death, sin, darkness, they no longer dominate us. They don't have power over us the way that they did before we knew Christ. We have been delivered. And an allusion is surely being made to God's deliverance of his Old Testament people out of Egypt. 
out from under the dominion of Pharaoh. In God's prelude to his Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, he says in verse 2, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now a person who doesn't know Christ doesn't realize it, but he is enslaved to sin. He's under the dominion of darkness. But if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are not enslaved to sin. You may feel like you are. You may feel like you don't have the power to break out of some sin that's got a grip on you. But if you belong to Christ, it doesn't have power over you. You may be giving it power over you because you think it does have power over you, but Jesus says you have been set free from that sin. Those who have faith in Jesus Christ, you have been delivered out of darkness into his light. Specifically, we have been delivered into the kingdom of God's beloved son, Jesus Christ. As Sinclair Ferguson puts it, we no longer live in the atmosphere of sin and darkness. We have been transferred to a new kingdom and we live and breathe in a new atmosphere. And the reason that we've been qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints is precisely because we've been delivered out of darkness. We've been transferred into Christ's kingdom. And so Beale writes, just as God's delivering Israel from Egypt, the house of bondage was a crucial basis for enabling them to be able to possess the land. So God's delivering people from the authority of darkness is the basis for them to be able to be qualified for the inheritance. There's an equation being made there. If you have been delivered out of the land of darkness into Christ's kingdom, you have been qualified for his inheritance. Our inheritance is, in one sense, the kingdom of Christ, but it entails more than that. It's also the hope that we have that, like Jesus, we will have our own glorified, resurrected bodies, and we will live forever in Christ's kingdom. And all of our inheritance, all of this glorious inheritance comes to us because Jesus Christ has redeemed us, as Paul puts it in verse 14. He is the one who has done the redeeming work. He is the one who has delivered us out of the house of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. If you believe in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You don't need to make atonement for them. But how? Because Jesus came to this earth. He was perfectly obedient to his father. He was sacrificed in your place and my place on the cross. He died and he was buried. But he did not remain in the grave. If he had, if he stayed there, if his bones were still there to this day, there would be no Christian faith. There would be no hope for us who are perishing. Instead, on the third day, he rose from the grave. He overcame death, and in doing so, he carried us and all who believe in him out with him into his kingdom. He carried you on his shoulders, and in doing so, he's making you into his temple. As he says, the dwelling place of God is with man. He is giving you wisdom so that you can be built into the temple of God. And in that temple, in us, he will dwell forever. And that, brothers and sisters, is good news. <laughs>